when I was a teenager, one of the highlights of my week was going to the school dance after the football game. Now, I, I, I struggle to remember everything about high school. I don't know what it means about my memory, but, but I believe that when you became a junior high student, you could go to the dance. Uh, which would have been, in my day, a seventh grader. You could go to the dance starting then. And I remember anticipating, waiting for the day that I could reach the age that I could go to the school dance. Now, this is what would happen. After a football game, they have a school dance, they have things ready, people going. You go to the door, uh, the main door to the school, and you'd, you'd pay your money. Now, you paid money with the money you had earned yourself. I'm just saying that to all of our students. I had to earn my own money to go to the dance. Mom and Dad did not give me money for the dance. It was my money that I earned, uh, just to give you some encouragement to do that on your own. But once you made it through the front door, you went on in and you opened up the cafeteria doors. Our cafeteria was also the place where we had our stage for, for uh, drama presentations. And it was the place we had our school dance in our cafeteria. So you went and you opened up the cafeteria doors and your world changed. All of the lights were dimmed really low. And the music was really loud. And you entered into there and you were excited. And you immediately went and you stood against the wall with your friends and you stood there and you stood there and after you got tired of standing you found a table that they use you know for for the cafeteria and you sat with your friends and you yelled at them because the music was so loud in order to have a conversation you had to yell at your friends across the table or yell at their ear and their ear right beside you standing against the wall and you'd stand there and you'd talk yell uh, and you would check out the opposite sex, and you would, uh, you know, get e excited making fun of other people out on the dance floor, and then the time for the dance would be over and you'd leave. And that went on for months. That's how we did it. Month after month after month, I would go, and I would stand in the, in the corner or stand along the wall or sit at the table, and the most dancing I ever got for those few, first few months was the tapping of my toe to the beat of the music. That was just about it. But one day, one day, I finally realized, I uh, summoned up enough courage to go out there and dance in a group of my friends. It was a crazy dance. I, we did everything, you know. As one did one thing, the other tried to top that. And we flop around on the floor and run around and jump around and everything else you can imagine. That's what we did with our friends. And we started to have fun. And I realized this is what dancing's all about. Having a good time with your friends out there on the dance floor. At least that's what I thought dancing was all about. Until one more few months went by. And I finally found what it really meant to experience the depths of, a da of, uh, of the dance. The joys of the dance. And that all came when one day I finally summoned some more courage and asked a girl to dance. And it was in the midst of that awkward, you know, barely touching each other, swaying back and forth in circles, that was the extent of the dance, in circles, that I realized what all of the older students, older peers of mine why they enjoyed the dance so much, because it was in that very moment, as you swayed back and forth, circling each other, that you realized, I'm with a beautiful creature. And she is looking at me. And nothing else in this whole place matters except for me and this person in front of me. And I finally enjoyed, at least understood, what it meant to experience the joy of a dance. Now, you might be asking yourself, why in the world are we talking about dancing as the church? What does that have to do with worship this morning? Well, let me explain. We're starting a new series today. It's actually a 14-week series. It's going to last all the way until Easter. It's called King's Cross, The King's Cross. I'll tell you why it's called The King's Cross here in a moment. But it is a study through the book of Mark. It is a study of the life of Jesus, really, is what it is. And it is my hope, it is my desire that as we walk along the road with Jesus, that we don't just learn about Him, but that we get to know Him. And not just get to know Him in the sense of knowledge, 
but get to know Him in the sense of we experience what He experienced. We live how He lived. And we become, to a greater degree, connected to God and Jesus through this series. Now, the idea of this series comes from a book called King's Cross by Timothy Keller. Uh, Timothy submits, and, and many commentators agree, that Mark is really separated into two halves. The first eight chapters deal with Jesus as king. The last eight chapters deal with Jesus going to the cross. So we're going to look at these, all of these chapters of Mark. For the next 14 weeks, we're going to look at Mark in this series. And it is my desire that we get closer and closer and closer to Jesus. So back to the question. Why talk about dance this morning? If we want to be the church that God called us to be, then we must get closer and closer and closer to God. And with that in mind, I want you to listen to a quote from one of my favorite all-time authors. His name is C.S. Lewis. I'm sure you've heard of him. And this is what he says about the Godhead, about the tri triune God, about the Trinity, as some would call it. This is what he says. He says, in Christianity, God is not a static thing, but a, dy but a dy dynamic, pulsating activity, a life, almost a kind of drama. And then I like his last line. He says, almost, if you will not think me irrever ir irreverent, a kind of dance, a kind of dance. The Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, they are giving of themselves to one another. They, they are giving each other glorifying love that brings them this indescribable happiness from before time began until forever. They are in this relationship of love. And C.S. Lewis describes that relationship as a dance. And that is the point this morning. C.S. Lewis describes it as, as a dance, and that's what I think God is calling all of us to get involved in this dance that He is involved in. So I'd like for you to turn with me to Mark chapter 1, and we're going to look at the dance this morning. In Mark chapter 1, we find Jesus inviting His disciples, and by extension, inviting all of us to enter the dance. Now, His invitation is a simple one. Come, follow me. But it is an invitation that to be quite honest, challenges us to go much farther than we have ever been with Jesus. That is what Mark is calling us to come to. Come into the dance with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. He's calling us to learn what it means to get close, to get intimate with God. Let me ask you a question. Do you want 2013 to be exactly like 2012? If you want 2013 to be like 2012, then I'm going to submit to you that the rest of this sermon is going to be of no value to you. It's completely worthless. You might as well stop listening. Start doodling on a piece of paper. Start texting your friends. Do anything but listen. Because if you want anything, if you want 2013 to be just like 2012, then you've already got the system for that. You know how to do that. But if you want a deeper, more dynamic relationship with God, than you've ever had before? If you want to know God in a way that you have never experienced before, if you want to go deeper with God and join in His dance for 2013, then now is the time to listen. Listen to what God tells us through His Word. So if you want to dance, if you want to participate in a greater closeness and intimacy with the Lord, then there are some things you need to know. So if you will, turn with me in your Bible to... The first chapter of Mark. Turn to Mark chapter 1. All the things we need to discover about the dance are found in Mark chapter 1. Now before we actually talk about those things we are discovering about the dance, I want you to see the relationship that C.S. Lewis describes is found in this very first chapter of Mark. In verses 10 and 11, we find the Godhead interacting with each other, glorifying each other, loving one another. Here in these two little verses, it's at Jesus' baptism. And before we talk about the dance, I want to talk about this description of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here in these two verses. Right after Jesus is baptized, it says, 
Verse 10, as Jesus was coming up out of the water, He saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on Him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are My Son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Mark's description here really would bring all of his readers back to the creation in, in the creation story, it says that the Spirit hovered above the, the, the darkness there. You know, hovered above all these things. The expanse of the, of the emptiness there. In one translation, however, it says that the Spirit fluttered like a dove. And so when Mark uses this language, all of his readers understand what he's calling their attention to. He's calling their attention to the Godhead. The God, the Father, Spirit, and Son who were in creation are the exact same God Father, Spirit, and Son who are participating here in Jesus' ministry. The beginning of Jesus' ministry. And Mark says, this is the picture you need to have of who God is and what God wants for you. So what do we need to discover about the dance this morning in Mark chapter 1? Well, the very first thing you need to understand is that I am not prom king and neither are you. I'm not prom king and neither are you. You, the very first three verses of this, this text, Mark chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. In the beginning of the gospel, excuse me, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the, de- in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now it's interesting to me that Mark skips the nativity. He completely skips the nativity story. Now that's not because the nativity story is not important. But for Mark, the most important thing is to get us face to face with who Jesus Christ is. And so he starts right there. He just jumps right to Jesus. And he says, Jesus the Christ, Son of God and Lord. In fact, he says, Jesus, God, divine, King of our lives. Now, Son of God, as Mark uses it here, that would have been an earth-shattering statement in his day. To call someone the Son of God would have been an unheard of thing. And Mark uses it. He says, Jesus, He's God's Son. He is divine. And then he falls back and, and talks about prophecy, and he says, not only is He divine, but He is Lord. He, he's in control. He, he should be king of our life. To that very point, Mark pushes us. He says he's not just Savior and friend and brother, which Jesus is, and those are important to us, but he says he's divine king. He's the only one who should have place, have the place of Lord in your life. Mark tells us there's no need to vote for king of the dance. Because there's only one choice. The divine King Jesus. Now you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, I've already made Jesus the King of the dance in my life. Well, have you? Have I? Have we really done that? Much of the time I believe we live as if we're the King of the dance. As if we're central to the universe. I don't do that, Todd. You don't. Well, do you ever say things like this? I don't like that. Well, what does that have to do with it? Well, that, in my estimation, says that you are deciding for yourself what is most important. And if you don't like it, it shouldn't be done. I would prefer this. I want that. You know what all those statements say to me? I am the most important. It has everything to do with me and what I like and what I want and how I want to see things happen. It's me who's the center of the dance. Not God, not you, and not anyone else, but me. But I want you to listen to what the King, Jesus, says. The divine King. In fact, not just what He says, I want you to listen to the description of His life. How He lived differently than we would expect even a King to live. It's found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This is one of those texts that is foundational to the, to the church and, and to Christianity. 
Because it redefines kingship completely. So Paul starts it like this. He says, Philippians 2.5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So he says, you need to pattern your life after Jesus. You need to live as He did. You need to think as He did. Your attitude should be the same as His. And then He says this, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made Himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now I thought about stopping there because that shows the humility of Jesus, but I wanted to go on because it shows what God does with our humility. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Until we get to the point where we make Jesus king of the dance, we will never enjoy what we have been called to until we get to the point that we recognize I am not king and he is. We will never enjoy the dance we've been called into. The second thing we need to recognize is to really dance requires a change of heart. Now, I want you to look at verse 15 with, with me in Mark chapter 1. Verse 15, Jesus is calling the disciples. And in verse 15, he says this. He says, the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, I love Jesus' word in here. He tells us, you can't join the dance and have everything the way it was. You can't have intimacy with me and still try to have intimacy with the world. That's really what he says. In fact, he expresses that in two different ways. In order to explain that, he expresses it in two different ways. And he says the first way is this. You need to repent. You need to repent. Now, for most of us, we would define repentance as a turnaround. And that, that is what it is. A, a U-turn, a, a realignment of our life's compass to true north, Jesus Christ. That's what we would understand repentance of. It is a changing of our heart. A changing of the way that we live. Now to me this makes perfect sense. Jesus in essence is telling us you can't keep living in the old way of life and expect to enjoy something new now. He, he's saying you can't live like you used to but somehow expect because you've taken my name that all things will change and there'll be greater joy. He says you've got to change the way you live in order to experience the greater joy. You must repent. So he starts off and he says you need to repent. Now the second expression is sometimes a little harder for us to embrace. Because he says you need to believe the good news. You need to believe the good news. He in essence says you need to alter your life because nothing is as important as the gospel message. Now I know lots of times we define belief as just an assertion of facts. You know, I accept these facts, that's belief. No, in the Bible, that's not what belief meant. Belief meant I accept these facts and I change my life according to these facts. That's what belief meant. And he says you need to change your life because of the good news. Now he doesn't just say good news as if just part of some good news out there. But good news in the, in the sense of this is the greatest of all news. The kingdom of God is near. This is the greatest of all news. You can be a part of the kingdom of God. We need to embrace that. That news should bring us such joy that we should change the way we live because it brings us back into intimacy with God. It is no accident that Jesus tells us to repent first. Essentially, take your eyes off yourself and place them on me. And it is also no accident that Jesus goes on to say, and by the way, you need to live your life reflecting that the greatest news you ever heard was the gospel message that Jesus restored a way for you to be back in the dance with Him and His Father and His Spirit. We've all heard the saying, His heart or her heart wasn't in it. We mean that 
in the sense of, you know, they really weren't giving it their all, you know. Their heart wasn't in it. That really could have been the slogan for my first year of college. That could have been my theme. His heart wasn't in it. In fact, I barely maintained passing grades. I often turned in assignments late if I turned them in at all. There were many a days I woke up, pulled sweatpants off the floor, <laughs> slid them on, walked all the way across campus, stood at the door of my class, looked in at the professor and the other classmates and said, nah, I don't think so. And turned around and went back to bed. Walked all the way back across campus to go back to bed. Or go play ping pong, one or the other, you know. Those important things of college life. I ended up with C's, D's, and incompletes. Now, I wish I could blame my poor grades on my lack of ability or lack of intellect or any of those kind of things, but the truth is my poor grades came were a result of my lack of motivation. I really just didn't care. I had no passion for class. I had no heart for learning. And as a result... To be quite honest for, with you, after a year of college, I dropped out for a while. Oh, I'm done with this. I can't stand it. Now, the point I'm trying to make is this. You can't do anything well. You can't do anything excellently if your heart isn't in it. If your heart isn't in it, you're not going to do a good job at it. If you want to get real close to God, if you want to experience intimacy, if you want to excel at the dance He's called you into then you have to give your heart to it. You can't partly give it. You can't a little bit give it. You can't show up on Sunday mornings and assume that's enough. You've got to give Him your heart and your whole heart. You must take your eyes off yourself and give God your heart. Embracing the good news of the gospel and getting excited about what God has done. The third thing we need to recognize is that I must allow Jesus to lead. If I'm going to the dance, I need to make sure Jesus is leading. Verse 17, Jesus says, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Come, follow me. How could Jesus' words be any clearer than that? I want you to do as I do. I want you to follow my lead. I want you to keep in step with me. That's pretty clear in my estimation. In fact, Jesus isn't the only one that makes it very clear. Paul makes it clear in talking about the uh, Holy Spirit in Galatians 5, verse 25. Paul says it like this. Galatians 5, verse 25. Paul, talking about us following the lead, says it in these words. Galatians 5, verse 25. He says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Keep in step? That sounds a lot to me like dance language, doesn't it? All you have, uh, all of us have been called to keep in step, to follow the lead of Jesus, to give complete control to the one who is directing our lives. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that song. It's a Carrie Underwood song. I can't remember how long ago it was put out. But how many remember this song? It's called, Jesus Take the Wheel. You remember? Here, I, I never did like the song very much, but that's irregardless. Jesus Take the Wheel. It's about a woman, a mother, and her child in a car, and, and she loses control of the car on the ice and throws up her hands in desperation and calls for Jesus to take the wheel. It's kind of the song, in my opinion, a last-ditch effort to save her and her baby. Now, I don't know how Carrie Underwood heard about it, but, but that's a true life story for my, for my life. I, I mean, literally. Uh, not exactly a baby in the backseat and a mother driving, but, but it was like this. The similarities are striking. I know she stole the story from my life somehow. I'm not sure how, but she did it. But here's how it really happened. We were on the way to or back from vacation. We were, we, <coughs> excuse me, went to see my grandmother and grandfather, both sets, in Pennsylvania. And I can't remember if we're going to or going home, but one way or the other, we were on the highway and we're in the car. And there's been snowing, so there's snow on the road. And me and my brothers are in the back of the station wagon. We always made the back like a bed. We're laying down in the back. 
uh, taking a snooze, as it were. Mom was driving. Dad was resting in the passenger seat. We're moving down the highway. All of a sudden, we round a bend, and I feel the brakes go on, and I look up, and there's traffic stopped on a snowy road. The problem was when the brakes applied, all of a sudden, the car kind of got out of control. Here's what happened. Mom started to try to correct, but kind of overcorrected. So dad reached over and he started correct the wheel. He took over from the passenger seat. He's moving the wheel that way. Okay, well he overcorrects. So mom gets back and she's moving the wheel this way. And back and forth it went and we finally stopped right before we hit somebody and we were safe. The whole time, however, I was praying, Jesus, take the wheel! <laughs> Jesus, you got to do a better job than my parents are doing right now. The truth is, Jesus always should have the wheel. We shouldn't have to call out to him, take it now. These bumper stickers, God is my co-pilot. God better be your pilot. If he's the co-pilot, he's in the wrong seat. If you have that sticker on your car, I apologize. Go take a, <laughs> go take a razor blade, cut the co-part off. You'll be all right. <laughs> the truth is, Jesus shouldn't just have control of our life when things get traumatic. When we've dug a hole so deep we need some help. When we're frightened or fearful. He should always, always be in control. Jesus, here in this text, He says, come follow me. I want you to think of what He's asking these disciples, these men to do. He says, I want you to leave family. I want you to leave career. I want you to leave the comfort of everything you know. And I want you to immediately come and follow me. That's what He's called us to do too. Make me the most important thing in your life and do what I say. Live as I live. Follow where I go. Join the dance and let me lead. One last thing that we need to understand about the dance is we need to invite others. We need to invite others. That's what he says, verse 17, the second half, and I will make you fishers of men. That's what he's communicating to us. Fishers of men. We need to be attracting others to the dance. We need to be luring them in. Now, I'm not saying luring them in and hooking them so they can't escape. I'm saying show them what it truly means to be in love with God. Christianity has often been called exclusive, an exclusive religion. And on one hand, they're right. There is only one way in, that's Jesus Christ. But they're absolutely wrong, on the other hand. Because the invitation is for all. Not, not a certain group of people. Not people just like us. Not any of that. Not, not based on heritage or anything else. Based on whether or not you will accept the invitation to join the dance. All. Open to all. Back to my high school story of the dance. It was great. I enjoyed myself. But you know why I enjoyed myself? The only reason I ever enjoyed myself at the dance is because those who were out on the dance floor made it look fun. They made it look fun. Do we? Do we? Where are you going this morning? Got to go to church. Oh, man. I can't believe people aren't following you in by the droves. Man, look at the, look at the smile on that guy's face. Well, or that upside-down smile. It's, it's a form of a smile. It is called the good news for a reason. It's the only news that is truly good. It's the only news that truly brings joy. And it's the only news that results in us being intimate with God. Why wouldn't you invite others to this dance? It's time for us to dance. It's time for us to get off the wall, get out of the pew, and dance with God. Are you ready? Are you willing? Will you get close? Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for all you bless us with, and I recognize how great and mighty you are. And so I pray that each one here will embrace how great and mighty you are. We will embrace the invitation. We will be excited about the good news. We will change our heart and get involved in the dance. I want to be as close to you as I possibly can. And so it is my prayer that I can abandon all the other things that distract me from focusing on you and focus on you. 
that I can walk with you, that I can be led by you in obedience so that I can enjoy an eternity with you. Let that joy spread out into a world around me. I pray the same thing for each one here, that the joy they have in involving themselves in the dance with you will spread out into a world around them so that others will come and give their lives. Thank you, God, for all that you provide. Thank you for the invitation to the dance. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.